Hello, Booktube, and welcome back to our read-along of uh, the New Testament, specifically the Gospels and the Acts of the Apostles. We've done the Gospel of Mark, and then Matthew, and then Luke, and then before we move on to God Help Us All, John, I thought that Luke naturally goes together with Acts of the Apostles. They were written by the same person, almost certainly written by the same person. Together, they make up a huge portion of the New Testament. So in the King James Version of, of the New Testament, we are reading Acts of the Apostles. And we, uh, we just had a very dramatic scene. <laughs> we just, the chapter that we read last time was the martyrdom of St. Stephen, the first martyr of the Christian church. Uh, a, an add-on, an employee that the apostles hire to look after the books, to look after the money, who, who starts to preach on his own and wonder work very, effect, very effectively. And he is taken up by the chief priests and leaders of the Sanhedrin and arrested, put on trial. And in the last chapter that we read, he gives a long speech, <laughs> a long, long speech, uh, he, apparently in his own defense, although it's not really. Really what it is is first a uh, catechism. He schools the elders and the chief priests for a long time on the ins and outs, the facts, and the chief, per, the main personalities of their religion. Moses and Jacob and Isaac and whatnot. He, he schools them on all of that. And eventually brings the story around to saying that all of this, this whole story that I'm narrating to you, that you know perfectly well because you teach it, uh is leading to two things. One, the Messiah, and two, you being the bad guys, because it did lead to the Messiah and you executed him. So not only do these these rabbis and, and uh, specialists and Sadducees, not only do they have to sit through the humiliation of this nobody telling them their own business, but also at the end, they're the bad guys. He's pointing them and saying, Jacques Hughes. Uh, so they drag him out of the temple and execute him. They stone him to death. Uh, and obviously there are logistical problems with that we're, we're looking at this just as a book not as a religious text we're not we're not reading in any homiletics here so just as a book you would think well a they wouldn't have let him talk for an hour like that if they if they knew that he was just schooling them on you know isaac begat jacob they wouldn't they wouldn't let him do that they would have interrupted him long since and b if they're free, if they're okay with dragging people out of the temple and stoning them to death, they would have killed uh, Peter and John first before they did anything to Stephen. It's an obvious narrative contrivance that this nobody, who is not going to go on to found anything, who is not in any way going to found an oral tradition of any kind, it's an obvious narrative convenience that he is then killed uh, when it wouldn't have been him. It would have been the leaders of the movement. Uh, but that we we end there. We are given one quick mention at the end of chapter 7 that someone named Saul was watching all of this and received the notice of it. This is very important, and we move on straight from there in chapter 8. So that's what we'll read right now, and we'll see what we make when we get to the end of it. Uh, and Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Church? There's a church? Okay, all right. Uh, and devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. And as for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women committed them to prison. Therefore they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. So we're not, not only are we, a, are we a church, and not only are we a persecuted church, but we are not just preaching for the remission of sins and the coming of the kingdom. We're preaching, we're preaching Christ now. Uh, and the people with one accord gave heed unto these things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did, which we don't see. We're not told about the miracles. Uh, for unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. We never see those scenes. Uh, it'd be interesting. I'd, I'd love to see it. I'd love to see the details here. I'd love to hear the preaching. Where is the Acts of the Apostles Sermon on the Mount? Where is the version of that? Uh, and there was great joy in that city. 
But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that he himself was some great one, to whom they all gave heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard, because of that long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believe, when they believed Philip preaching the, the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Very important point there. A little thing. We won't have to dwell on it much. But notice how often the writer of this text is including women. Uh, that's retroactive, I believe. The, that the literary tradition in which this text flourished knew that women had played a huge part in making this church, this religion, happen. So better to work in mentions early. Uh, then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John who, when they came down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only that they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So it's not the same thing. Being baptized is not the same thing as receiving the Holy Spirit. Interesting little dif differentiation there. No elaboration on it. We just move on. Then they laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of, the, of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. And they, when they had testified and preached to the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages uh, of the Samaritans. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that goeth from Jerusalem into Gaza, which is desert. And it, we're not done with the chapter yet, but if you're reading this chapter, just as a person, just as a reader, you're thinking, what? What about Simon? <laughs> you described a character who was healing people with sorcery. He's not going to be in the story anymore? <laughs> what are you talking about? What, are you just leaving him? Is he still healing people? What are his sorcerer's abilities? What, what, what on earth? You're just going to let that character go? And also, I might point out here, just as a parenthetical, that obviously there are passages of Acts of the Apostles that the American fundamentalist movement ignores, that they very conveniently ignore. Because Peter uh, when Peter and John are laying their hands on people, and they are imparting the Holy Spirit. So these people have been baptized, but they do not get the Holy Spirit automatically by doing that. Peter and John are giving them, they're infusing them with the Holy Spirit, this this wonderful awakening of your true self that the apostles themselves felt. Uh, they can do that with the laying on of hands. And when Simon sees that they can do that, he obviously sees that something real is happening and says, I'd like to buy the ability to do that. Can I, can I pay you for the ability to do that? I'd like to be able to do that to people. And uh, Peter says, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. <sighs> any idea in the American fundamentalist movement, any idea that the gifts of God cannot be purchased with money is long gone. <laughs> long, long gone. A, a total charlatan like Kenneth Copeland can have healing services at his gigantic mega-dome pre-church that seats 100,000 people and that is packed every Sunday, he can say, well, today I feel like healing someone. But you don't get in for free. You, you don't get brought to him for free. You don't get the laying on of his hands for free. No, it's all money. And it's all very carefully controlled. 
Kenneth Copeland says, well, today I'll heal someone. But he doesn't go to a hospital and do that. He does that in a very carefully controlled, ecstatic environment. And it's all generated by money. It's entirely dictated by money. Uh, everyone in the, the, well, for instance, the, the New Word of Faith movement, all of them believe, I can indeed pay money to get this ability. <laughs> I can't get it any other way. Uh, but anyway, let's let's move on. Instead of rabble rousing, we don't want to rabble rouse. Uh, uh, so uh, Philip has been sent into Gaza, which is desert, uh, and he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch with great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, had come to Jerusalem for to worship. Well, tell us more, please. Tell us more about this man. Worship? Is he a Jew? Is he coming on his own? Does Queen Candace know that he's coming? I uh, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? Budding book critic here. Uh, and he said, How can I except some man should guide me? Yes. And here you have it in the scripture. How can you understand what you're reading unless Steve guides you? Are you okay? <laughs> uh, and he desired Philip that he should, would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he had read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment was taken away and who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this? Of whom, of himself or of some other man? I wonder what Philip's going to say. <laughs> uh, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they were on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What dost thou hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Okay, so... So Philip takes this eunuch uh, to the nearest body of water to baptize him. The eunuch has a chariot of his own. He is obviously involved in his queen's business. Does he give any money to the church? Does he? Does he have a name? <laughs> does he? Does Does he preach the gospel of Jesus when he is back in Ethiopia? Again, this is just being sketched in. Of course, the, the notion of storytelling, the notion of what we consider to be a full story was not the same then as it is now, but I don't think there's a reader of this who doesn't want more information. And what is that, that business at the end? Philip and the eunuch are talking. They're coming, up, they're coming up out of the water of baptism. They're conversing with each other when suddenly Philip disappears from where they are, which is in Gaza, and ends in Azotus, which is 20 miles, 50 miles away. It's... It, it, He's taken away from this eunuch. Why? Why does that miracle happen then? It's it's interesting. It adds, uh, like I mentioned, this is a very human story. We are dealing with humans here. But nevertheless, there's all sorts of supernatural elements involved. I have to say that for this chapter, that's the end of this chapter, is Philip disappearing and reappearing. Uh, but the supernatural elements in this chapter are pretty uh, irritating because they're not, resolved at all they're obviously stuck in fragments of a fuller narrative that existed somewhere else even if it was only oral they obviously are obviously there's a greater story to simon the sorcerer than the bit we get in this chapter obviously there's more about the ethiopian than we get in this chapter we get little glimpses here and it makes you wonder is a reader, not as a religious person, it makes you wonder, well, this is this is a chapter of Acts of the Apostles. But what if there were five 
Acts of the Apostles? What if there were four, like there are four Gospels? What if there were different Acts of the Apostles and they showed some stories similar, some stories different, and some stories wholesale? Wouldn't yeah, that be fun? I think, it's, I think it's likely beyond question that there were rival Acts of the Apostles, that there were rival documents like this. I don't think there's any question of that. Obvi I think it's obvious in the fact that these little stories are fainted and hinted at. Imagine what some of the stories in Matthew would be like if we didn't have any of the other Gospels. How weird they would seem, how out of context they would seem. Uh, but anyway, that uh, that is uh, the through line of this chapter. The most important thing is the is a thing that's tacked on at the beginning, almost certainly tacked on to this chapter, not part of it organically, which is a mention of Saul, another mention of Saul. Uh, that is, of course, going to be a narrative through line throughout all of the Acts of the Apostles, but not yet. Now we're still dealing with, uh, with our guys. They are preaching. They are working wonders. They are spreading the word of Jesus. Uh, they encounter a sorcerer. They encounter all sorts of other people. It's, it's an interesting story, but it seems all over the map. We'll see in future chapters if a greater cohesion is brought. Uh, but anyway, I'll wrap this one up for now, and we'll see you next time. <laughs> Thank you, Booktube.